we're going to be in Revelation chapter 17. As you're finding your location, I want to remind you that Calvary Chapel teaches book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, with the exception, if it's Christmas, we just did four messages for Christmas and New Year's. When Easter comes, we'll do Easter messages as well. But uh, the, the, the main meat is our Bible, of course, and uh, it's book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Would you stand, church? We're going to read our passage together, and then I'll share with you what the Lord has put in my heart. Before we start, I just want to uh, share this with you. We uh, arrived in western Colorado in January of 1995, uh, and we started uh, um, a church that was given to us, Calvary Chapel. We made it into a Calvary Chapel. But within that first year, 1995, this family came from the New England uh, states up there. And uh, they were a gracious family with us. Uh, they invited us over to eat at their home when their home wasn't built yet. I mean, it was like we, they brought us in for fellowship. And I still remember the timbers and the, the two-by-fours and sheeting the plastic to keep it warm. Again, it was January and their kids were very gracious to our kids. The folks were very gracious to us. And for the first time ever, you know, I came from a city. Uh, I went to their backyard. They had chickens. They had this and that. But they had a pig in their backyard. And uh, uh, we had never been close up to a pig in the backyard. So it began an adventure. Those kids, as you know, as Christians, we put our faith in the Lord. And we love the Lord. And he raises us. Would you welcome Isaiah St. Peter and his wife, Jen? Would you just raise your hand, Isaiah? These guys are that family that brought us in, and uh, we just felt loved and welcomed, and that's what the family of God does, and so it cheers my heart to see God taking care of our kids. So let's uh, pray, and then we'll read the scripture, and we'll share what the Lord has this morning. Father God, I thank you, Lord, because we can entrust our lives to you, and you watch over us, and you take care of us, and no one can love you as you love us. No one can love us as you love us. Yes, we love you, Lord. But the love that you give us, the care that you give us, we see it year after year after year, Lord. And we can hardly wait till we're with you in heaven. And all our friends, all our loved ones, all the acquaintances that we have met over the years, Lord, you're going to bring us together and we're going to sup with you, Lord. A great supper in the sky awaits us, Lord. We look forward to it. At this time, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be our teacher once again. Take this study, Lord, and make more of it, Lord, than what I or any human being can do. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Though we take a peekaboo into the future, you want us to be aware to know so that we are standing on solid ground, Lord, as we live in pre-trib times, Lord. That as our world goes bonkers, we would have a word to share, an encouragement for those who are lost, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Bibles should be open to Revelation chapter 17. We're going to consider the first 13 verses today. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, and God's Word says this. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the abominations of filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life 
from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as the kings with the beast. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Church, you may be seated. Trust you enjoyed worship this morning, singing to the Lord, singing of the Lord, and glad that the Lord is coming for us someday. God is faithful. He will come for us, and uh, we're looking certainly forward to that time. With six chapters to go in the last book of this Bible, the Re book of Revelation, we want to welcome you back to the future. <laughs> the world may not know what the future holds, and so the world gets a little skittish and will become even more as time goes on. But you and I are to know, and that's why this book is written, so that we would be the solid ground, we would be the ones that perhaps can offer uh, advice and certainly introduce Jesus to many who will still come before the Lord comes for his church. Uh, so God's word is revealed in a very special way to his church so that we can understand, we can consider, and certainly we can use it for his honor and his glory. So we thank you, Jesus, of course, for our salvation. Uh, we are saved, and so we will not go into the tribulation period. We will be removed from the earth in an event known, as we've spoken about before, the rapture of the church. People say, well, where is this rapture of the church? Where is it cap capsulized? And I want to share this slide with you real quick. The revelation of the rapture of the church is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18. We've read it, we have considered it, but just again, if you need it for a reference. So we completed the first 16 chapters of Revelation, and thus we learned through the seven bowls of God's wrath, the last thing that occurred, that uh, these judgments ended the tribulation period. In the next two chapters, chapters 17 and 18, we go back. And we are given more information, more details of what else has to, uh, what else has to come uh, to an end that has everybody right now at, at this time in Armageddon, if you may. So chapter 17 before us uh, deals with the end of what we will call religious Babylon. Religious Babylon. Chapter 18, when we deal with this, uh, it will deal with commercial Babylon. Thus, I invite all of you to continue to be with us as we complete this book and as we consider the rest of the scripture. So let's consider religious Babylon um, falls. It does fall, and this is part one. We're going to do this in two Sundays, today and next Sunday as well, as long as we're still here. So as we say, I want to begin with all of us on the same page because we have skipped a, a month through December with Christmas messages and New Year's message. So I want to get us all in the same page. Uh, number one, Babylon. The word Babylon or the city is mentioned 287 times or just under 300, if you may, uh, in our Bible. Only Jerusalem is mentioned more in the Bible than Babylon. Babylon was a literal city along the Euphrates River. And we learn from Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 10, that following the flood, the city like Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Manhattan, Seattle, became headquarters, right, where the majority of the people started to express uh, 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 hostility towards God. They wanted nothing to do with God. God said, go out and multiply and, re and replenish the earth after the flood, and, and uh, you uh, even in the beginning, but they settled. They wanted to build. And so later on, as we are learning on our Wednesday night Bible study, uh, Babylon, uh, to the Jews, were the definition of cruelty uh, and evil. And they felt like, man, all this stuff was invented in Babylon, right? If God had an enemy, the Jews believed, it was Babylon. They were greedy. 
They were lustful, they were carnal, and certainly they were idolaters, right? So Bible scholars agree that in John's day, when John is writing this, our author, Rome embodied the fulfillment of the Babylonian attitude. Rome, in John's day, hated the Christians and their ways, right? Kind of like the cities that I mentioned to you, but really, most people in the world hate you because you represent Jesus. Most people in the world hate uh, the Christian way. That's why not all our neighbors are here. That's why all of the, uh, in all the churches that are in Manchos, and you know, there's like 72 always listed, maybe let's just say half of them, 35, are born again. They agree with you. And, you know, they might like prefer chocolate other than vanilla, but uh, they believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Christendom has more than Calvary Chapel people. You guys know that. I know that you know that. But even in all our churches, they're not full anywhere. You are a minority that comes to church. So we are a remnant that's here. In the world now, let's take it further. In the world, we are small, right? The rest of the world is marching to a beat of a different drummer. It's the world's beat. It's the attraction for them. So again, we say that most of the people in the world, they have an attitude towards God, and that's why they don't worship. Now, in John's day, Rome typified Babylon. For us today, the world system is well on its way to be worse than the Babylonians' way. And tomorrow, after the rapture of the church, Antichrist, Babylon, in both uh, its religious and commercial aspects, will have influence over our world as no empire has ever in history. It will be over the entire world. All right, so now we're on the same page, right? Religious Babylon is our subject. Consider your Bible. Look so you read, so you follow along, so that when you're out of here, you trust the Holy Spirit. Someone's going to ask you, what did you learn about church today? Well, where were you at? You're going to say, we were in Revelation chapter 17. What did you guys talk about it? Open your Bible, trust the Holy Spirit, that he will bring things to remembrance. That's part of his job with us. He's our helper, and he'll bring things to remember. You'll be able to speak of it through your personality, with your family, with the people of your influence, uh, and you might be able to win someone for the Lord. All right, so then one of the, look at verse one. So then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with wine, uh, with the wine of her fornications. So I want you to just, what pops out of here, number one, is kings of the earth, those are the ones in charge. They are like the president of the United States, the uh, prince of Saudi Arabia, the kings of, of Russia and uh, Ukraine, everyone, right? Those are the kings of the earth. They're telling you about the elitists of the earth. And then the inhabitants of the earth, that's the rest of us. <laughs> that's the, the, the kings are the somebodies, and the rest of the people are the nobodies, if you may. So you have two classes of people going on, and you hear what the angel is saying, right? Let's make some observations here. First, from number one, uh, verse, from verse one, what the angel has said to John should assure us, and certainly will assure the people at this time who are reading this, and that is this, her judgment is assured here in the beginning of the conversation. So we said, one of the angels said, uh, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, come and I will show you the judgment. So showing the, the judgment tells you that these things are going to be judged. They're not going to go on forever. You and I should know that. Things come to an end, right? But the world, when you're in a mess, you're in a mess forever. If you're in a crisis, you think, how am I going to get out of this crisis, Right? But those that know the word of God, we see that things are temporal on this earth, and we move on. I loved our men's study, our men's breakfast yesterday, because it reminded us that we should not be a people that are anxious for things. And let me bring it to you in a nutshell. Jesus said, I must go, and I go to prepare a place for, is that someone else, or is that you? That's each and every one of us. Perception changes everything. If Jesus has promised to go and prepare a place for us, then whatever you're going through right now is temporal. 
It's temporal. You should rejoice because there, God will help you get through all these things. You're in a tough situation. I believe it. A tragedy has happened in your house. I, I weep with you. I'm in sorrow with you. But I also know that Jesus has told me, I go to prepare a place for you. And in my Bible, I haven't been. I go to prepare a place for you. That's the confidence I have in the Lord. And I pray it's your confidence as well. No matter what you're going through, Jesus already has your house ready, your place ready. You're going through the earth. You're going to have much tribulation in this earth, but your finish line is in heaven. So it changes perspective. How we deal with things right now, wreck the car. Oh, honey, the wife comes home. I just wrecked the car. Husband said, it's all right, babe. Looking for a reason to buy me a new truck. You know, or whatever. Well, however it works out in your house, right? But that's really what I want you, want you to be thinking. So from verse 1, the angel has said to John, he assures him, he assures us, and that is that her judgment is assured here in the beginning of the conversation. Church, we are to learn from here that there should never be doubt in our mind regarding the fate, the ultimate failure of Babylon as a world religion, as a world system as well, right? Second observation from verse 1. Religious Babylon is called the great harlot. The great harlot. As a religious system, Babylon came into being long before Christianity. You need to know that in history. But in satanic imitation, imitation it anticipated the coming uh, of a true Messiah for them, right? According to religious history and legend, history and legend, the Babylonian religion was founded by the wife of Nimrod. Uh, her name was Semiramis, Semiramis, right? And Nimrod, for those of you who know your Bible, he's the great-grandson of Noah. So these things are recorded. She was the high priestess of idol worship, and she gave birth to the son, to a son who she claimed was conceived miraculously. That's why Satan, the great copycat, Satan, the guy that, that who said, hey, from her seed in Genesis chapter 3 will come one that you will bruise his heel, but he'll bruise your head, right? So all these things come up. Satan, the great uh, copycat, tries to put things in order to derail uh, the things of the Lord, right? So she says, she claimed he was conceived miraculously. The name of that son, right, that she had was named Tammuz, T-A-M-M-U-Z, and it was considered, he was considered a savior. Now, many ancient artifacts remain with the familiar motif of the mother Semiramis, right, holding the savior infant Tammuz, which predate Christianity. Of course it does, right? It was also said that Tammuz was killed by a wild beast and then miraculously brought back to life. Baal was the local Canaanite name for the Babylonian Tammuz. All right, we make a third observation here. The Bible makes specific mention of some of the features of this classic religion that the Babylonians had, right? In fact, we just studied, we were just in Ezekiel chapter 8, right? We just finished 9 this last week. We were in 8 before we broke for Christmas. And, and, and what Ezekiel was protesting in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 14 was this, he protested against the ceremony of weeping for Tammuz, right? Who was doing this? The Jews were doing this. They had been captured, went to Babylon, and then in Babylon, Ezekiel there with them is, is, is trying to encourage them, hey guys, come on, we left our idols, we're being punished because of our idol worship, and you, the ladies were, as it was a ceremony for the women, Jewish women were weeping for Tammuz because it was part of the legend, it was part of the religion. Let me, let me bring it to us today. We have myself with Pastor Mike, Pastor John, we have uh, Mike Anderson, we have Charlie Rayfeld, we have teachers here at the church. Should we all be, have a heart attack this week and we're gone as leadership from this church, are you going to start going back to the old ways and weeping for Tammuz? Prayerfully not. Each and every one of you has a Bible. Most of you that have been with us can read through the scripture and speak a few words of encouragement. We can find something to help the people of God. 
But to, to, to say, oh, our leadership is gone. What are they doing over there? They're weeping for Tammuz. Come on, let's go be religious. That is a bunch of, well, it's not for you, right? But to, you see history, legend, true, that it affected the Jews during the time of their captivity. And so Ezekiel, he complained about it. He says, what are you guys doing? Christians have to wake up. You don't have time to be flirting with other deities, gods, or whatever, but the rest of the world is doing it. It doesn't matter. We stay true to the word of God, right? That's, that's what we're called to do. All right. So um, get to the last part of verse 1, and here we, we read that this great harlot, religious Babylon, sits on many waters. That is, she presides over many nations. Now, again, if you're new to Scripture, you're thinking, Man, this is so weird. Sits over many waters. What does that mean? Go to verse 15 so you know that we're talking about people. Verse 15 real quickly says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the Bible interprets itself. So when we say that, uh, that she presides over many nations right here, we're saying that she has universal international character this religion does and so this unifies right all false idolatrous such uh, idolatrous religions such as apostate protestants who are the apostate protestants they're people who say that yeah yeah yeah, yeah i'm christian I, I live i'm from america i drive a chevrolet i use levi's i love apple pie right so I must be, but when we start saying what the Lord says, that you need to forgive your uh, neighbors and you need to forgive family members. Well, I ain't forgiving that. That guy better never show up at my house, says the disgruntled father-in-law. Or that person, da-da-da-da-da, says the wife that uh, lost her husband or whatever to someone else. Uh, excuse me, the Bible says if you say you're a Christian, you know, we are to forgive others. How can God forgive us if we're not forgiving others? So you're either following the word, and you are, or you say, well, you know what? I had enough with your religion. I'm out of here. And that's what happens. And that's what I mean by apostate uh, Protestants. They draw near, but then when they get to the nitty-gritty that we must love, as Christ loved us, and we're not ready to love someone else, eh, you keep your religion. I'm out of here, right? There's apostate Catholics, right? Apostate Catholics, uh, the Catholic, as you know, the word means universal, uh, but those that all of a sudden, the word says that you shall have no other gods before you, and yet they're worshiping and praising some of their icons, some of their statues, uh, some of those things like that. Uh, I, I know that in the Catholic, uh, um, what do you call it, catechism, uh, there's a section there that Mary was also, res uh, also resurrected. And it's found because it says it is believed that the apostles went to her uh, graveside or something like that, and they didn't find her in her casket, so she was resurrected. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of our Catholics that have gone to the side believe that Mary can save you. She is a co-redeemer. And so they, like the apostate uh, uh, Protestants, when you take them to the Word of God, they say, uh, no, I never heard, you know, whatever. Or they, they say, yeah, maybe if everybody's doing it, I guess that's right. But you can't be. You, that's why it's the narrow road, guys. You're either in the word and you believe the word and you fall in the word or you'll fall for everything else. So when we're talking about a, a, uh, a, a woman, you know, like this, uh, a, a, a church that takes everybody in, it's a bad thing. It's, it's a harlot. Right? Uh, it's not only the apostate Protestant, apostate Catholics, but it's a smorgasbord of other religions in the world that did not believe in Jesus but went every separate way. So, church, the woman noted here as the great harlot is a picture of it. So it's a picture. You're, you're seeing it as, he could, as the best John could do, but it's a picture of false religions that will dominate the world during the tribulation period. Years ago, many thought and identified <laughs> this great harlot as the Roman Catholic Church. However, false religion is not limited to one church. It can't be one church. False religions are many churches. It's not just one. 
It's everyone that was left behind when the rapture comes. They form a conglomerate. It's a big smorgasbord, and it comes together under government now that's going to happen at that time. So the false prophet and the Antichrist, they have a huge following because of religion. And since they would not become the, quote, bride of Christ, they became the harlot with their way, not God's way, right? Their way will be what unifies them. Well, those guys were a little bit too tight on that. I think we could uh, compromise and do it this way. Well, those guys said you had to do this and that, but we don't have to do that. Let's all agree. And yeah, well, here comes this guy from over there, and he has his ways. Well, are his ways bad? No, he hugs a tree or he does this and that. Well, I'll bring the tree huggers to or whatever, you know, uh, people that worship the creation instead of the creator. Let's just get us all together under one religion. Isn't that going to be sweet and neat? We'll all be together, right? So the Bible calls it, that's a harlot. You know, that whole system is, is someone that has brought all these things in, has nothing to do with the Lord. But it sounds kind of spiritual, and people love their spiritual things. That's why some of them have rocks, and they have this and that. You go to Sedona, Arizona, man, I mean, these guys, are, you, any shop you go into, they're, it's a little weird. And you don't think it's a little weird, then you, God bless you. It is big time weirdness, right? I mean, to be adoring a rock, it, something has happened to man, and that is that he doesn't want God, he doesn't want to submit to the word of God, so we go off and drift, and that's not a good thing. All right, we go from verse 2, and our observation from verse 2 is that the kings of the earth committed fornication. Again, those are the somebodies. Jesus, in his message to the church of Thyatira in chapter 2 of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 22, he warned the church to repent of her sexual immorality or else he would cast her in a sickbed, right? And those who commit adultery with her uh, into the great tribulation, unless they repented of their deeds. God's always given us a chance. He gives us truth so that we can respond. So this would happen unless you repent of your deeds. Well, here you go. They did not repent, and the rapture came, and they were left behind. Church, if you don't serve Jesus, you will serve anything else, anything and everything else. You're either serving the Lord or you're serving everything else. Our world today just today, wants all religions to come together where everything but the Bible is tolerated. They don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way. And they say, you guys said that. We didn't say it. We read the word, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus said it. We just espouse it. We just share that with people, right? So now that his true church, those who have believed and trusted in Jesus, the doers and not hearers only, are gone, they unite, the ones that are not gone, they unite to form religious Babylon. Everything goes with this new religion. Second part of verse 2, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Church, the idea of fornication often is associated uh, throughout the Bible with idol, or idol worship or idolatry. This new religious system will be full of empty promises. And she will say, serve up lies after lies as the masses of people become drunk with her lies. Right? So, again, the kings are the somebodies. The inhabitants of the earth are made drunk. They're dictating you must put on, you must be vaccinated, you must be this and that. When it says you must, you have to this and that, everybody that's left you are either going to follow suit or you become an outsider immediately, right? And so they're going to dictate, and that's why they become drunk with the wine of her fornication. Lies after lies after lies. Verse 3, so he carried me, John says, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Carried, so let's, let's make an observation. Carried away... To a deserted place, a wilderness, is the right place uh, for a vision of judgment. Let me just share this with you guys. Every once in a while, you need to get away. You need to get away to spend time with the Lord. And, and going to a place where there's not all this distraction, out of cell phone, right, out of this and that, 
uh, it's a time to spend with the Lord. It's, it's a great time for you to be seeking out the Lord. Take your Bible, right, and, and take some time and take an attitude, a heart and a mind that, you know, I'm just going to give the Lord this time. Lord, just speak to me while I'm out here. And, you know, maybe it's nothing. You'll be, be out there and fly goes by, mosquito bites you, I don't know, <laughs> whatever. But spending time with the Lord is a good thing. It, a lot of us come out of that uh, pretty healthy. Most of the guys in the past used to do that, and it's a good thing for us to do. All right. So, um, John sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. The harlot rides the same beast, seven heads and ten horns. That was previously seen in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, right? The Antichrist and his dictatorship. So, let's observe. Her position is that of a rider. How many of you guys uh, saw Heartland, right? I talked to you guys about Heartland. Great, healthy show to watch, right? We never saw a horse riding a person, right? It's always a person riding the horse, right? So John is seeing this picture, but it's speaking to him, right? right? It's, the, it's the harlot riding the beast. So this beast turns out to be the system. That's what I, wa- I want to take you guys to start seeing this. And the beast is religion, so this religion is kind of leading the management of the government or leading what's going on. John is seeing it as a picture, but for you and I, we need to understand that (laughs) this is symbolic, right, of what is going on over here. So, again, uh, that that her position is that of a writer, it should tell us that she is in charge and supported by the political power of the beast. So this is the peekaboo, right? Peekaboo into the future. It's revealing to us that the woman or harlot will have great influence at this time as she is the one sitting on the beast. It's what the picture is telling you. Uh, first part of verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Church, the woman is blinged out, as we would say, right? Blinged out. That is, she is clothed with emblems of luxury, right, and government. Scarlet is, a, a, when we talk about scarlet, that is brightly colored cloth. You know when someone, you can see them from here to Kentucky Fried Chicken, or on the other side of Walmart, someone that where has a bright red, red thing, right? It's a, it has your attention. It just gets your attention. That's what scarlet is, bright scarlet things, right? Uh, we see that. Uh, uh, second part of verse 4, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. All right. So uh, we, she is dressed in luxury and offers abominations. That is idolatry and impurity. That's what filthiness of her fornication is about in this sumptuous setting. So this religion and this government for the rest of the people is very attractive, right? First of all, it's very rich. You know, it has everything you can think about that, you know, and you start thinking, well, maybe they'll give something to me. I don't know what the people are going to be thinking in that time. But they don't have the Lord. Most of them don't have the Lord, right? God's doing a work. We read about the two witnesses. We read about the 144 sealed. We've gone through that. But for the, still the masses are being controlled by this thing that are going on, right? Purple and scarlet. Listen, purple and scarlet. When you think about purple and scarlet during John's day, they were the colors of splendor and magnificence. The dyes to make the fabric, these colors were um, uh, rather rare, and they were very costly to have these colors come out. Everybody was just blah, the way they used to dress in the old days. So these then, as we remember your history, these are the colors of kings and rulers, whether economical or political, it's bright colors that separated them from the rest of the people. Bible commentator Barnhouse, he notes, quote, we find in the course of church history that one of the deadliest marks of ecclesiastical corruption is the lust for power, temporal power, right? So uh, in the old days, especially in the Robin Hood movies or things like that, you always see the priest uh, most of them are crooked. Most of them are for themselves and, and uh, the money. And, and, sometime, and, and, and sometimes today, well, even today, we see that. I just saw uh, on, uh, you can Google it, the uh, top 100 uh, paid ministers 
in the United States, right, or outside of the United States. These guys are making millions, millions of dollars a year as their salary, you know. And, and we're talking about some organizations that you might support as well. It's just you need to be aware of these things so that you are wise in how you use your money and what you're doing, you know. If, if I showed up in a Rolls Royce on Sunday, how many of you guys would think I know where my tie check went? Right? It's a giveaway. I mean, it's a giveaway. If I said, hey, uh, I'm going golfing this weekend, guys. Would you pray for me? I'm going to take my plane and I'll be in Hawaii. How many of you guys would think, you know, I don't think I'm going to really give a tithe anymore. I'm going to give 1%. You know, God, you take care of it. Watch over it. While I say that, there's thousands and thousands of pastors across America doing what God called them to do. They're, they're giving their best to the Lord. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of little churches sprinkled, peppered, salted all across the world that God's, God is pleased with them. But he's coming for his church. And when his church is gone, the vacuum of all these half-beliefs, the all beliefs, well, this sounds good, well, that sounds good, well, let's just make one. This is what's going to happen. This is the harlot that brings them all in. We are to be wise stewards today and check things out on our own. We have a responsibility to do that. But when you find something that uh, it's time to do, we're going to do. Saturday, we had a board meeting here. And one of the things that came up is, let's revisit, and most of you guys see the missions that we support, uh, mission in, uh, endeavors that we support right here on the wall in the kitchen. We have a little bio on each one and what they're doing. But there's wisdom when our board says it's time to revisit because some of these we've been supporting for a long time. Uh, the first mission that we started supporting when we were in Columbine, it was time that uh, we started supporting a missionary, was John Bonner from Peru at the Bible College. And uh, he is one that we still stay in contact with. We see, I see him at, at different places. We went there. We've taken a couple missionary groups out there, you know, to uh, do some work out there. And uh, it was great helping them build the college. You should see the college today. And we went a few years ago to Peru. But it is beautiful, a beautiful setting for kids to come from South American countries mainly, but certainly from abroad, to come and, and spend a year or two years with the Lord in, in my Bible college. But some of them might not be. And so we're going, it's our job to visit that. Uh, from our board uh, yesterday, we are going to come up. Pastor Mike is in charge of this. going to come up with a... Uh, a day that we can have a meeting here, and it's going to be like a business meeting. It'll be our first ever, you know. But we felt that it's important for you to know, you know, what, you know, you know, where the money is, if there's money. You can obviously see there's money, you know. You know we're not sitting outside. Thank you, Lord. The heaters are on. Some of us even take off our jackets because they're on so much. But uh, the point is, it's, it's a business meeting for everyone to ask your questions and, and whatnot. I, I, we think it's healthy for a church to be transparent. So, Pastor Mike is going to lead that endeavor. I'll be golfing in Hawaii. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. All right. So, so uh, all this indicates what we've been talking about, that one, she dominates or is very influential at that time, the church that's going to come about at that time. Uh, secondly, this religion system has unlimited wealth. And if you remember when we were in the book of Daniel, we did Daniel before Revelation so we could have them together. Daniel chapter 11, verse 38 stated that the willful king, which was Antichrist, would reward in this way through wealth and things like that. So church, here we have again a reference to a cup, a golden cup full of abomination. This means that it is, that it's full means that this religious system has not repented, has no intention of repenting, right? Instead, she has defiled herself uh, with all the false religions of the world. Thus, her cup is full. And verse, we get to verse 5. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, then there's a comma, Babylon the Great, comma, the mother of harlots, plural, and of the, abom of the abominations of the earth. So let's break this down. Let's, let's break this down so you understand this, right? And, and let's begin with this harlot uh, who on her forehead was the name. Mystery. A mystery in Scripture, in, the, in, in our Scripture, is a previous hidden truth that was going to come about, right? But it was a mystery. 
Now it's divinely revealed. There's at least 11 mysteries in the Scripture. Let me share one of them to you. The true church, all who follow and are obedient to Jesus today, is not revealed in the Old Testament. The Jews never knew that there was a church coming made of non-Jews. It's in the Scripture. There's hints all over the place, but they never knew this. And how do we know this? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 through 9. Uh, here's something else. The false or Antichrist church was not revealed unto here where our eyewitness John writes chapter 17. Because most people think, well, it's a church, so it must be religious. It must be something good. Absolutely not. Not all churches are good churches. You know, it doesn't matter. It, and the scripture reveals it right here, right? And once again, just in case you came late and you didn't hear me say this, the true church, God's true church, those who have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, trusting him that he's coming, they're taken up to heaven in the rapture, right? The pretenders are the ones who are left behind and they go into the tribulation period. The religious system continues, the world does, and who knows, maybe they're even going to come and use this building to gather, but we don't care. We're not going to be here. We're going to be gone to heaven. And that's the great thing for us, right? But this new mystery, the anti-Christian church, it comes into being and it hangs out for a while. Second, uh, secondly, note this, that God calls it Babylon the Great. As I mentioned in the beginning, Babylon is mentioned about 287 times in the Bible. In fact, if the Bible wasn't called the Bible, it would probably be called the tale of two cities, right? Babylon and Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of God, and Babylon is called the world, what the world has, right? A little, bit, a little more on the physical city of Babylon. God had said to the people that she should go out and populate the earth. But here in Babylon, the people said to one another, ha, quote, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is, is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. Genesis 11.4. God did want us to be scattered on the earth. Not like, like just you know, twiddling our thumbs out there. He wanted us to occupy the earth, to be fruitful in the earth, to manage its resources, to get out there. And still, the, the thought of the cities are, stop building new cities. And some of us are saying, yeah, where are they going to get the water, right? Listen, water comes from God, does it not? If we were obedient, God would find a way to get the water. If we were real people of faith, from North Delta to uh, White Water, we would build a city in between and trust the Lord for the water. And you would say, nah, that's pretty smart, Ben because the water's coming off the mesa, underground water coming through, uh, you know, and you would succeed. Of course he would. But not because of that, but because we trust the Lord. They made Los Angeles, and it's a desert, you know, without water in L.A. Oh, my goodness, what a problem. But they take our water. It's good to be an ex-Angelino, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, here we go, right? So man built his tower. And the city of Babylon was built around it. Man consulted the stars, not God. For they would rather ask the zodiac for instruction, direction, than to ask God. And you know the rest of the scripture. That tower was never finished. It was afterward called the Tower of Babel, right? For God confused the language of the people. So as I said, Babylon became the fountainhead, or as we here in the Western Slope call it, the headwaters of false religion right? The second church, and this is for you, the second, the minute, uh, the hour that one ventures off the narrow path of the Word of God, right? But the path that God has shown us through His Bible, through the Word, that person joins the wide road that leads to destruction, right? You don't get off the path of Jesus. Well, we got something else, brother. We think, eh, no, thank you, you know, well, you know, you ought to consider, you know, Jesus can't be the only way. Uh, yes, he is. You know, you can't get off this path. You get off that path, you venture into Babylon churches, if you may. It's a second death, eternal separation from God. It is the way of religious Babylon. Therefore, she is called, verse 5, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So 
Thirdly, note that she is called the mother of harlots with an S, plural, more than one. And you see, uh, when mankind has done away with the established way, the first way shown to our first parents, Adam and Eve, then doing away opens the door for everything and every way which seems right unto a man, right? Before one knows it, one realizes it, they are deep in the abominations of the earth. And what would those be? How about murder? How about stealing? How about this and that, right? The abominations of the earth. Everything that's wrong, everything that goes against what God has said. First part of verse 6. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So church, our eyewitness, John, he saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. That is, remember chapter 13, 15 where the unholy trinity caused as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And also chapter 6, verse 9, the souls that John saw under the altar who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So many people are coming to Christ and many people are being martyred. They're being killed. And the people praise God. They've chosen the Lord. You know, they realize it's a big lie that the world was selling them. They turn to the Lord, and, and that's why it's important for you and I to share his word. Some of our relatives are not very recipient to the word of God. Perhaps some of our own family members have walked away. But we tell them, we encourage them, we, we still share with them, right? You're called to be salt, right? We're called to be a little salty in some areas, right? Uh, but with grace, tenderness, the way the Lord treats us, God never says, get in here to heaven or I'll whack you. Right? That's not the Lord. He loves us into heaven. He loves us, and that's how we should be with our family members. But if the rapture was to happen today, many of, of, of uh, my relatives would not make it. Many of them would say, man, Ben was right, because I'm reading that millions are gone. They're saying the Martians took him, but Ben never believed in Martians, right? And, and so they're, uh, they're going to be thinking, and prayerfully, they'll read a letter that we've left or a tape that we've left with, uh, for them, a Bible, the Bibles aren't going with us, though the Word of God goes with us, but not necessarily your Bible, you know. Um, so it's important for us to continue to share with them and what we believe and what the truth of the Scripture says for the future. All right. So um, when I saw her, I marveled with great ama amazement, says the second part of verse 6. This I blew John away. He was more than amazed. Verse 7, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery. Ah. Oh, Mystery, the hidden truth of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So, church, a couple observations here. Number one, it's awesome that the angel is there to explain. Amen? It's awesome that you and I have the word of God so we know what's coming in the future and we don't wake out, you know, freak out. Uh, second observation is the seven heads and the ten horn focuses on the Roman Empire, the new Roman Empire of this time of the beast rather than single antichrist part. First part of verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not. Let's see if you could follow this, right? See if you could figure this out. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottom of the pit and go to perdition. You know what that sounds like to me? There is a train coming from Grand Junction 100 miles an hour and there is a jet leaving Manchos at 500 miles an hour. Where would they meet and collide. Remember those math questions? I always said to the guy next to me, I'll give you five bucks if you give me the answer. I'm not going to even waste a brain cell on this. This is not for me. Sometimes people read the word of God and they're looking at that and it whew, right over their heads so you won't go back and, and check it out. But as you learn as an adult, if you don't understand paragraph one, you're going to miss the rest of the book. Understand before you move forward. When I speak to prisoners and guys that are incarcerated, I say you have time, time to learn to read. It is time to learn to read with understanding. Because once you learn to read and you get it, oh my word, it opens up page after page. It brings you in to what the authors are trying to say or the teachers are trying to teach. And then all of a sudden, the lights turn on. And that's a good thing for the lights to turn on for you and I. All right, so here we go. All right. Uh, we have heard about this empire as we read it from the book of Daniel, right? And the book, uh, and this book as well. So let's break it down. Uh, we see the first part. The beast that you saw was, church, this means 
uh, we have not seen a world power as the old Babylonian or Roman Empire was. So this speaks of past history. The beast was, right? The second part, is not refers to the present. This type of rule as these past empires had do not exist today, right? Is not. And then we get to, will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Ah, ready or not, here it comes, this kind of an empire, right out of the pit of hell. Who else could raise up one man, one government to rule all of man? So here it comes. Satan is the one that's doing this, right? So church, consider our daily news today. If you turn on the news, right? Our world is in a mess and you don't know all of it. Why? It's going to get out. It's a matter of time before it gets out. Everything that they're hiding, everything that's going on, I mean, it's, it's weird, but you don't get all the news all the time, right? Our world is in a mess, but soon after the rapture, this world will cry out for a world leader as Israel cried out, we want a king. The rest of the nations have a king. We want a king. We want direction. We want leadership. It's going to cry out for that after the church is gone. So there will be a reactivation, if you may, of a Roman Empire type of place uh, led by Satan. And that's what Daniel showed us with the toes and all this stuff at the end, right? But the last part, and go to perdition. Ah, ah, this is a breath of fresh air to guys like John, who was living under Roman rule at that time, right? And he penned this book and was abandoned to the island of Patmos as punishment uh, by, by the then very much alive Roman Empire, right? No wonder he marveled with such amazement. Verse 6, from verse 6, he must have thought, especially seeing the future, that this past type of government would be no more. Just like you and I used to think, and we find it difficult to believe that our world can never go cashless. You remember that in the 70s? Our world will never go cashless. We will never give up this or that. I mean, it's, there's no ever room for one leader. Are you kidding me? Right? But now, hmm, this, things are changing. So here the angel says that this type of government will go to perdition. Again, we get it. We understand it won't last forever, right? This means, or then this speaks of its destruction by, of course, Jesus Christ. The good news for John, and it's good news for the rest of the Christians at that time. Second part of verse 8, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is or shall be present. So in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, you might remember, Jesus told the church of Philadelphia, because you have kept my commandments to persevere I also will keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So Jesus keeping us, keeping his church from that hour, this hour, is a good news for us. What he told uh, Noah is preach that I'm going to destroy the world, the earth, and have them come into the ark. Of course, we know that only Noah and his three boys and the, their wives, Noah and Mrs. Noah, <laughs> They were saved. God had always shares with us before destruction comes. That's, that's how he is, a good God. So the true church is gone, but those who are left behind will marvel at the reappearance of a Roman-type empire uh, that is well and it's alive at that time because even Americans today cannot believe one will. Uh, the elitists of our world who get together to make the plans for the rest of the world uh, one of them knows that they want to be the charge. I don't care what table you sit on uh, uh, in the world, right? It's always to get to the top. When I worked at McDonald's, uh, first as the guy mopping, I wanted to be inside behind that counter, and then I got to be the fry man. And when I was the fry man, I wanted to be the guy that flips the burgers. And then enough of that, because one time I leaned on that grill, ah, you know, and, and I said, this is not for me. So I wanted to be the guy at the window. Good morning. Have you considered our large fries today? You know, I was that guy with a little hat and, and stuff like that. Uh, so man always is looking for the top, and so will be, uh, and, and they get this one guy, right? So those who dwell on the earth will marvel. So the true church is gone, but those who are left behind will marvel 
that the appearance of this government type is, is there as the old one. And you will remember when in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, John, our eyewitness, he wrote this, quote, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his, and his deadly wound was healed, and the world marveled and followed the beast. I remind you, church, that, again, we're focusing on the Roman Empire more than just the beast here, the new revived Roman Empire that was being uh, in play at that time. So observe that those marveling are those whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. God knows who's going to say yes, who's going to say no. The Lord gave them a chance. He visited them just as he did. He gave Pharaoh a chance. But wicked men have a way of hardening their hearts. They always do. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. Oh, my goodness, it's 10 o'clock. I did not know that. Therefore, you can come back to hear the rest of the Scripture. Sarah, would you come out wherever you are? <laughs> Hold your line there. I knew I was, I, it's just good stuff, right? We're not in a race to finish through the scripture. God's word is here so that you and I can understand it, so that we own it. You cannot be a person without excuse. And then if you're here visiting and you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the time to do so. You don't want to be one that goes into the tribulation period. We want to go with the rapture of the church. Let's go bow our heads and pray. Father God, we want to thank you for your word once again. Lord, I'd like to stay till 3 o'clock, <laughs> but uh, we must be sensible in our time right now, Lord, and therefore we can come back, and we look forward to coming back. We ask, Lord, if you have not come and taken us by now, that you would meet with us here next week, and Holy Spirit, that you would continue our teaching through the book of Revelation. If there's anyone here, Lord, we pray that has not given you their life, that they would do so today. So church, while heads are bowed, Christians, you're praying, and just looking around, is there anyone here that has not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ? If not, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I want to lead you in a word, of, in, a, in, a word in a prayer, asking the Lord Jesus to come into your heart. Anyone at all? And so, Father, we thank you, and we ask that you be with us this week as we think and contemplate and anticipate that, yes, very truthfully, you can come for us at any time. Lord. Help us to be ready. Help us to be ready to share with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.